Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are deep, deep, deep into the into the fall semester, and uh, and we are uh, as excited as at the beginning of the semester uh, in regard to our programming. Today we have a couple of uh, two, excuse me, uh, two professors from uh, the University of Delaware, and I will I will introduce them in just a moment, but one of our colleagues, Jade, uh, Jade McDonald, who is a student, will be reading the land acknowledgement as we are uh, always doing when we begin this in, in terms of honoring our uh, Native American uh, brethren and sistern. Jade, would you like to start? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, so today we recognize that the California State University of San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the Sam Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the Cal State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Um, consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples by offering this land acknowledgement. We affirm the Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. Thank you, Jade. Thank you very much. So it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our guests today, uh, Dr. Earl Smith and Dr. Angela Hattery. Uh, Dr. Smith is Emeritus Professor of American Ethnic Studies and Sociology at Wake Forest University and Professor of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Delaware. He earned his PhD in Social Anthropology from the University of Connecticut. His teaching and research focuses on urban sociology, teaching, uh, excuse me, sociology of sport, criminal justice, and race. He is the author of 11 books, and I will not name them all right here, but this also includes uh, his, their latest, Policing Black Bodies, How Black Lives Are Surveilled and How to Work for Change, as well as dozens of book chapters uh, and so forth on uh, the impact of social inequality on black families. His book, Race, Sport, and the American Dream, which has been published in three editions, remains the only book on the market that examines structural racism in sports world. And, uh, and again, thank you for joining us, Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Angela Hattery is Professor of Women and Gender Studies and co-director of the Center for the Study and Prevention of Gender-Based Violence at the University of Delaware. She is the author of 11 books, including her most recent book, published in 2020, Policing Black Bodies, How Black Lives Are Surveilled and How to Work for Change, and Gender Power and Violence Responding to Intimate Partner Violence in Society Today. She teaches courses on race and gender, inequality, families, and methods. Uh, their, their forthcoming book, as you can see, they collaborate quite a bit, Way Down in the Hole, Race, Intimacy, and the Reproduction of Racial Ideologies in Solitary Confinement, and we will have to have them back for that for sure, explores the ways in which racial antagonisms are exacerbated by the particular structures of solitary confinement. And they can certainly start right here in California because we have an infamous um, segregated housing unit called the SHU in several of our prisons. And so uh, we, would, we would love to have you back for that. But their topic today is policing black bodies, how black lives are surveilled and how to work for change, and uh, I'm not sure who's going to start, but but um, please go right ahead. So uh, we want to thank you for inviting us, and I'll make this really clear and straightforward. About 2013, 2014, uh, more specifically at the point where Mike Brown was being killed in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, we looked up 
And we kept seeing these talking heads on television uh, trying to explain what was happening. But it was clear to us that they really didn't have a clue. Because what was really happening around the time that Mike Brown was murdered was the systemic racial policies that were holding Black people back and the unaccountability of various police forces around the country. And so we had a conversation and say, you know what, we, let's start looking into this and putting our heads together. And whoa, it just blew us away that this wasn't only about the killings of unarmed Black men, unarmed Black people, this was huge. And even though we knew that, you know, the Fugitive Slave Act had existed, even though we knew that plantation prisons, especially in the South, existed, we didn't connect the dots until we started outlining this book. And what we began to see was this overall policing of Black people in so many spheres that it just blew us away. And I can't remember exactly how the table of contest text unfolds, but we said we need to talk about policing both literally and symbolically, because otherwise, you would fail to see the larger picture. Um, today, we're going to look in a more narrow vein at the policing of Black children. Everybody, I'm sure, that who've been attending your, your workshop uh, have heard and used the term uh, school the prison pipeline, and, and it's a, you know, it's a nice jingle. Uh, it's cute. Um, but it's a little deeper than that when it comes to the policing of young Black children. Um, recently, we've been seeing in the news, these judges, especially in places in the South, Tennessee, Kentucky, etc., are essentially selling Black kids to the juvenile justice system with impunity, taking little kids eight and nine off the street for misdemeanors, even for being bystanders of schoolyard fights and locking these kids up. And everybody knows that once you've been locked up, that whole phenomena of second chances goes out the window. So that's what we, we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about some young people who've been caught up starting with the juvenile justice system uh, well into their adult lives. Thank you. Angela. Sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> Thank you for, this, for setting this up. Um, so as Dr. Smith said, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the policing of young Black kids' bodies, um, but not all of them are going to sort of fit the definition of the school-to-prison pipeline. So part of what we wanted to do was talk about some examples that are really more symbolic policing um, and some examples that don't necessarily fit that moniker, but are, at the, are still and remain ways in which young Black people's bodies are policed um, in ways that are damaging to them and also are removing them, as Dr. Smith said, into a system of either the criminal legal system or in other cases, um, into systems where they lose rights, they lose liberties. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna frame it around sort of three or four stories. And the first three of the stories come from policing black bodies. And the, we're gonna end with a little teaser, which is a story that's, come in, that's going to be in our forthcoming book um, way down in the hole. And certainly California, uh, we would love to come back. Uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about California and talking to folks who've been part of the resistance movement and the hunger strikes 
um, in San Quentin and, and discussions of the shoe. So it'd be really fun to come back and talk about that. And if you want, at the end of the, we're not going to present super long. We want really want to have a robust conversation. Um, we certainly can talk a little bit more about that book if it's interesting. I thought this was a really important quote to start a talk like this. Racism, according to Foucault, is the social distribution of death. Like an actuarial chart, it predicts who would thrive and who would not, who would not. And this is a, a quote from Sadia Hartman's book, Lose Your Mother. Um, and I really was just completely struck by, um, by this quote in the sense that actuarial charts we think of as you know, people using an insurance, the, the insurance business and deciding how much to charge you for car insurance or uh, life insurance, that for all intents and purposes in the United States, being black is essentially a, a death sentence compared to being white, that simply knowing someone's race, we can predict all kinds of things about their life chances for all of the structural reasons that Dr. Smith began with, and we could certainly talk more about that. Um, so this is Anarcha. Um, Anarcha, if people are not familiar with her, uh, was a young woman, a young girl. So we choose her because she's under eight, 18. Um, <clears throat> and while she was enslaved, she was uh, used in medical experimentations. Some of you might be familiar with her story because you're familiar with the story of the man who made his reputation off of these surgical procedures on Anarcha. His name is J. Marion Sims, and he's often considered to be the father of modern gynecology. Um, and J. Marion Sims did some really important stuff um, under his experimentations. He developed and, and sort of created the first modern speculum. Um, he, he used Anarcha's body to, to develop and hone his skills on a particular surgical procedure to repair fistulas. And I'm not going to talk about, you can Google it, um, but to have a fistula is a really burdensome kind of um, injury um, that often resulted, and in the case of Anarcha, probably both from violent sexual assault and also from very difficult labor and delivery. Um, so while Anarcha, Anarcha was a child and she had fistulas that her, you know, the person who owned her, the master wanted repaired so that she could go back into, you know, the business of producing um, more bodies to be enslaved, uh, he employed J. Marion Sims and said, you can have Anarcha to protect, to perfect this surgical technique. And so she endured more than 30 experimental surgeries as a child. Um, that were that would be, you know, it, it's impossible to imagine or overstate how painful these surgical procedures would have been. And he performed them without anesthesia because he believed that black people couldn't feel pain. Um, and so trying to think about using a child's body, no matter how important the contributions of those experiments were from, you know, if you're a woman in the audience um, or a women bodied person, you've probably experienced an OBGY exam OBGYN exam and had a speculum and, you know, it's a, the fistula surgery is life-saving, especially in parts of sub-Saharan Africa where fistulas are still very common, but, but he perfected these, these techniques on a child without her permission and without using anesthesia. And so we think of this as an example of policing black children's bodies, using them for whatever means, you know, necessary um, without any consideration. And certainly if you follow J. Marion Sims, you'll know that they've taken his statue down in Central Park. Um, the question is, you know, where's the statue to Anarcha? Wh when does Anarcha and two other young girls who were experimented upon, Betsy and Lu Lucy, when do they become named as the real founders of modern gynecology? Because it was their bodies um, upon which all this knowledge and expertise was built. So um, it's yep. important here to point out that uh, Annika uh, wasn't just pulled uh, from thin air. Uh, in the book, we have a whole chapter on experimentation on Black women's bodies. Uh, some of those uh, parts of our research points out that a lot of these women were like Annika, young, 
under 18 years of age, and that many of them were recruited into these experiments via the school systems without their parents' approval. So that chapter is loaded with information about these types of practices. Thank you for that. And we can go back and talk more about these. I think part of what we wanted to do today was give you a flavor of what's in the book and how the, <clears throat> the power of the argument is in building it around all of these different ways in which, which Black bodies are controlled and policed, both uh, literally and symbolically, and, and th thinking about how they're all connected. So to Dr. Smith's point at the beginning, you know, we really sat down to write the book because we realized that not a lot of other people were connecting things like this um, or the eugenics movement with the killing of Mike Brown. They weren't connecting some of the other things that we're gonna talk about. And we felt like that was really the power of a sociological analysis was to be able to bring those, those concepts together and, and bring these cases together. Um, you can talk. Do you wanna me. talk? Okay, this is Contrell Jackson. Um, some of you might be familiar with Contrell's story because he eventually was released from prison through the work of Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. But Contrell was um, 14. This is a picture of him when he was 14. When Contrell was 14, for those look that- Look at him, look, just take, I want people to take a hard look at this photograph. This is a boy, a little boy, yep. who we know as a grown man. I mean, this, this is heartbreaking just to, just to see this photograph on this screen. Excuse me. No, it's, uh, thank you. I mean, it's a typical, it's a typical, you know, elementary school picture that most of us had taken and, or our kids had taken and they sit on a refrigerator. Um, so yes, do take it, take in control Jackson. Um, you can imagine him, you know, throwing a baseball, chewing gum, hanging out. Uh, doing all the things that young kids do. So when Contrell was 14, um, he and a couple of his friends got into some trouble and his buddies decided, and Contrell went along with them, um, that they were going to stick up a convenience, not a convenience store, sorry, a, uh, something that for those of you who are younger in the audience, we used to have these things called video stores where people went to check out videos like Blockbuster. And so Contrell and his buddies decided to go to a video store and they were going to stick it up. They were going to, you know, steal some money out of the cash register. One of his friends went in to the video store and he shot and, and killed the clerk as part of the burglary. Um, so it was a terrible crime, right? A, a person is dead just because they worked in a video store. Um, Contrell was standing outside um, he never went into the store. He never held the gun. He didn't have anything to do with the shooting other than he was there at the time that it occurred. Um, Contrell Jackson was convicted of a crime called, uh, oh my gosh, now it ran out of my head, felony accessory to murder. Um, and he was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole at 14. A life sentence without the possibility of parole at the age of 14 for this crime called felony accessory to murder. Um, the reason, according to the legal documents, that he was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole is because he had a very minor prior, um, prior charge for like joyriding a car. It was a, it, much like Khalif Browder, it was a very insignificant kind of um, charge as a juvenile, but that was used as evidence that he was um, you know, a, a, a lifetime criminal, um, a monster who it would be justified to lock him away for the rest of his life. And if you're not moved by, I mean, I just think like, I can't imagine being sentenced to prison for the rest of my life without the possibility of parole, but try to imagine it being 14 years old, 14. And if you're not moved by Contrell's story, there are 2,500 people currently serving these sentences juvenile offenders sentenced to life sentences without the possibility of parole, 25% of them for the same exact crime, felony accessory to murder. And almost all of them are young black men. So we are literally ripping young black boys out of communities and locking them away in the prison, in pr prison industrial complex for the rest of their lives. This also, has, oh, go ahead. What's also important, uh, Professor, is that 
um, to understand the, the prison industrial complex, it's important to know that almost every incarcerated person, male, female, whoever, almost every one of those people who we keep telling everybody about 2.2 million people are incarcerated and another million and plus are under the you know, auspices of the correction system, et cetera. Everybody knows those numbers. Uh, but what we really need to underscore here is that most people who are incarcerated will be released from prison. And we can pick out the names, household names of people like the recently deceased Charles Manson, who California people would, would know about. Uh, at some point, had he not died, uh, Charlie Manson would have been released from prison. Uh, so to give these young people, young boys, mostly young black boys, life without the possibility of, uh, what is it, Par parole, it's unbelievable. And it's only recently, very recently, that you begin to see activist movements against this type of a sentence. I was just going to add to that, that these sentences are now, it's unconstitutional to give a sentence to a juvenile um, life without the possibility of parole, but the, the legislation doesn't work retroactively. So each one of those 2,500 people has to then go through a process of being, of having their freedom restored. Um, and in the book we write about, do you want to talk about Henry Montgomery? No, I think the point is that if if what the Supreme Court did was say these are no, you can no longer give out this type of sentence, what they didn't do was say, you know, allow these people to walk free, especially since so many of them are 50, 60 years of age. Uh, to be able to walk free, they would then have to be retried all over again. And Henry Montgomery is one of the people who I think he insisted not to be retried. I, I'm, he I'm not he sure. was also not paroled. He's in his 70s now, and he's been in prison since he was a teenager. Um, and the parole board, he, it's, he's in Angola, and a black man, he, he shot a police officer and killed a police officer. And the parole hearing, all white people adjudicated that he wasn't fully remorseful. And so he couldn't be paroled, even though he's been in prison for more than 60 years, um, which is you know, just absurd. I think when you talk about these kinds of stories, how you cannot come to the conclusion that this is the deliberate removal of black bodies from the social political economy, um, which is really the crux of the argument in the book, that, that this is really what this is. You wanna okay. talk about our friend from um, Prince William County? Yes, because uh, currently uh, that body in Washington, D.C. is deliberating on whether or not to pass uh, legislation that helps people who uh, are in some unfortunate condition where they can't do a couple of things at the same time, like pay the rent, pay the mortgage, buy food, put shoes on your kids' feet, um, and so a young man in Prince George County, Maryland, um, whose family were receiving some type of social welfare payout uh, was in the school cafeteria. And um, he was 14. Like, he was 14 and in the seventh grade. Yeah. Like young people, he forgot to pick up his milk. Uh, he cut back in the line, uh, grabbed one of these cartons of milk. At the time, there was 65 cents. Um, and the resource officer um, took him, dragged him out, told him that he was stealing this milk, even though I think one of the lunch ladies was saying, no, he's on the list to receive uh, free milk, free lunch, free milk. Uh, but the officer didn't listen, and uh, he was dragged out of school in front of his peers. He was taken down to the police cruiser outside of the school. 
He was handcuffed, put into the back seat, taken down to the police station, booked, what, you know, people know what that entails. And um, I'm not, he wasn't even immediately released to his parents, which is what normally happens or what should happen in an incident like this. Look, wait, if you're white, what would normally happen is someone might call your parent, right? Or someone might say, hey, you're supposed to be able to have the milk, right? I mean, that, there's, there's nothing else to the story. I think uh, it's unclear that the young man and his mother, first of all, he still has a criminal record. Because he was charged. The young man and his mother, um, they, what do you call it? They have a deal. Um, he wasn't locked up. He wasn't sent to juvie. But he's still carrying a criminal record. And I think what's important is <clears throat> there are dozens of cases like this, where the school to this idea that the school to prison pipeline is about, you know, sending a kid to juvie for committing a violent crime. Um, and that becomes a prior, which then sets up like for control Jackson, a trip to the penitentiary. This was a 65 cent carton of milk. We've read cases about kids who took extra chicken nugget off the cafeteria line and they get booked in at the jail. Thankfully for this young man, his mom fought to keep him from being formally charged, uh, well, to, for it to go through the system. Uh, she had to fight for 18 months before she was able, they wanted him to plead guilty. And, and had she not had the resources <clears throat> to fight it, he would have gone to juvenile detention and he would have had the kind of criminal record that if he gets in trouble again, can send him down you know, to the state pen. And I think, you know, we were really stunned when we started to read about more and more and more of these cases um, that putting a school resource officer in the school means that you now have criminalized misbehavior. And those school resource officers are not in everybody's school. They're not in white schools. They're not in upper middle class schools. They're not in private schools. They're in lower income black, black schools. That's where they are. And it's a, that trip, you know, so you see a lot of graphics about the school to prison pipeline. I think for us, what we wanted to articulate in the book and really unpack here is, you know, this is literally pulling young kids into a system that then sets them up to become, to, to end up going to prison often for really long stints um, over something that when I was this age as a white person, someone would have just probably called my mom right? They would have just said, hey, you know, remember, you need to take your, your milk on time. Um, so this is devastating to Black communities, absolutely devastating um, and very deliberate. Daryl Hunt, um, I would uh, recommend <laughs> highly that anybody in this audience who uh, doesn't know anything about uh, Daryl Hunt, that they check out the HBO documentary about his case. Um, Daryl Hunt was a young African-American male living in the South, uh, the segregated South. And in the town of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, it was clearly known that the police would cruise the uh, uh, Black communities on the other side of the tracks, uh, to pick up these young men to essentially close out crimes. Um, in the days when Daryl and his uh, running partners were living in the community, drinking wine, smoking weed, et cetera, but not committing any crimes, uh, they would routinely be dragged into the police department uh, grilled by the officers and then told to, to you know, get out of here and, and don't get into any more trouble, that kind of thing. So he was known uh, to the police. I forget the exact date, but on a given date, a young white woman. 1984. For, excuse me? 1984. Working for the newspaper, local newspaper, uh, was raped and murdered. And again, the HBO documentary does a very good job of telling this story. Uh, to keep it short and to the point, 
uh, fingers were being pointed from the various young men, young black men that were being picked up and questioned about the crime. Fingers were being pointed this way and that way and every which way. And at some point, the fingers pointed to Daryl Hunt. You wanna tell some more about it? Sure, so Daryl was 19. So we, we, uh, we, we bent the rule a little bit that he was 19, but still, I think we all, if you're on a college campus, we know that, you know, that's still a kid, right? So Daryl was 19 when he was arrested and charged with the brutal, brutal rape and murder of Deborah Sykes. Um, and Daryl always proclaimed his innocence um, from the very beginning, he proclaimed his innocence. Um, he was tried um, in 1985 and convicted of her rape and murder and sent to prison for the rest of his life. He was um, tried, by, tried by an all white jury. An all white jury. Um, and he was sent to prison life without the possibility of parole. Um, his attorney, who's actually really one of the good guys, so he didn't go to prison because he had a bad attorney who was, you know, wasn't paying attention or whatever. Um, his attorney, Mark Rabel, is a really fantastic attorney. Um, and all that he, what he was able to accomplish was to keep Daryl from going, going, you know, from getting the death penalty, keep him off death, death row. But Daryl continued to maintain his innocence. And he, through a variety of legal maneuverings, he was able to get a couple of other trials. So they, they retried the case a total of three times, each time in front of an all-white jury. So his final conviction <clears throat> was in the early 1990s. Um, he was convicted for the third time, sent back to prison. Um, everybody thought like, this is it. It's, there's just no hope. We've tried every legal avenue to save Daryl Hunt. Meanwhile, he continues to proclaim his innocence. <clears throat> a very long story short, um, through a series of maneuverings that involved kind of what you might see on a Perry Mason or Law and Order, um, they get the DNA and they get permission finally to run his DNA. And it <clears throat> conclusively eliminated Daryl as the person who raped and murdered Deborah Sykes. Um, we, have to, we have to point out here that uh, persons who are incarcerated, according to the Supreme Court, do not have the right to access DNA evidence. Post-conviction DNA. Yep. So, so there's a case in Alaska. Um, the judges that wrote in favor of the case might sound familiar. Um, Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia wrote the deciding opinion in that case that you are not entitled to, not legally entitled to post-conviction DNA. So for a lot of folks like Daryl, they went to prison before we had DNA. All we, all we had in those days was blood type and that sort of thing. So Daryl was able to get it, thankfully, because he had a good attorney and a lot of people working in his corner, he was able to get the DNA tested. Um, but a lot of resistance to that. And, and just, you know, it's worth noting um, that you don't have a right to that. And, and if you think about a criminal justice system, not having a right to conclusive evidence that would free you, um, that doesn't sound like justice, right? That sounds like not justice at all. Um, so Daryl was eventually exonerated. Um, the, the attorneys in the case pushed back. They didn't want to release him. And I think perhaps most importantly, not most importantly, but one of the interesting points in the story is between his exoneration, between his release from prison and his exoneration, the local newspaper ran a poll and they asked the citizens of Winston-Salem, should Daryl stay out of jail, even though he hasn't been exonerated yet? And overwhelmingly, the white readers said, no, he should go back to jail. He probably did something. Um, so the, the idea here that you know, making a mistake on a black man's body is really protecting society because he's going to do something dangerous. He's going to commit crime. So even if we get him through means that are not legal or they are legal, but aren't appropriate or accurate, we don't need to worry about that because what we've done is remove a threat from the, from the community. Um, and I think that's, that's a really important um, framing for thinking about what happens to black men all the time. You, many people might in the room might be familiar with Central Park Five. It's a similar story. Um, there's a lot of stories that are similar to Daryl's, um, which is beauty, also striking, right? The beauty of the exoneration, it's not a pardon. And the beauty of the exoneration, if you pay attention to who's being exonerated and there's good 
good data publicly available to do that is that most, if you have 100 exonerees, from our data, we think we could show that of those 100, at least 50 plus or more are Black men. And I think what's even more important in our data, so we we gathered exonerations and we did a, you know, statistical analysis to look at what most people who looked at exonerations statistically have looked at what's the race of the person exonerated, who's obviously been wrongfully convicted. We wanted to look at the relationship between the, the race of the victim and the offender, and then also look at the crime. And what we found was not only are black men far more likely to be wrongfully convicted, but 73% of them were convicted of the rape and or murder of a white woman. So something that only happens 10% of the time accounts for 73% of the exonerations of black men. Um, and, and as Daryl's attorneys talked, you know, he was judicially lynched. I mean, this is a way that we continue to legally lynch black men, um, wrongfully convicted and sent to prison for the rest of their lives. It's just a tragedy and statistically, you know, a lot of your sociologists, um, that's clearly a significant finding, right? P less than 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.000000 odd infinitum, right? Um, something that almost never happens. Um, and and we're going to finish with a story from our forthcoming book. But yeah, but we but we 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 have to be clear that when you see the exoneree coming out the courthouse with his or her lawyers and family, and they're standing around microphones and everybody jumping up and down. And maybe later, depending on what state it takes place in, they might get a monetary settlement. But what it all amounts to is the arrest. It starts with the arrest, the false arrest of somebody who didn't yeah. commit the crime. Yeah. And usually that person is going to be in prison anywhere from 15 to 40 years. So when you see them at outside the courthouse happy as they should be, their whole lives have been ruined, the lives of their family, the, live, the, the livelihood of their communities. And this is happening more often than not to Black men. Yep. So when we talk about voting and how tight some of these, uh, you know, vote, these races are in the, in the voting arena, uh, these these folks weren't participating. I mean, they weren't having their vote counted because they couldn't. So this thing is larger than just one person, uh, one arrest, one exoneration. It's huge, and it blows up the whole community. And part of what we wanted to do by by sharing the the stories that we've shared here so far, Anarcha, um, Control Jack. And the kid with the, we, we don't know his name because he was so young, the 65 cent carton of milk kid, and Daryl Hunt is that they're all part of the same system. And a, a lot of folks who talk up, they, they, they narrowly focus on just the school to prison pipeline or just medical experimentation or just wrongful convictions without seeing that the larger framework is white supremacy, the criminal legal system that's used to extract Black people from the social political economy. And it's when we stack these together, we argue that's where you can begin to see that pattern. Um, so Daryl, oh, go ahead. You can, the, the footnote to the Daryl Hunt story is Daryl was exonerated. He got out, he got a monetary settlement. He set up a, um, what do you call Foundation. it? Foundation a foundation to help others who have been incarcerated. Uh, he was a, a, a good person in his community. Uh, he, 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 he held picnics for, for, for the locals in the community. And inside of, he was in prison for about 20 years. He was out nine years. Nine or ten, 10. Nine or 10 years. So he was, he was out of prison less time than he was incarcerated. And unfortunately, he committed suicide. He took his life. Um, you might want to say something about it, but he, 
it, it's just a sad story. Well, I mean, I think the point to underscore is that just because you're innocent doesn't mean that the criminal legal system doesn't extract the same price on your body. Um, it's, you know, it's still the same um, anguish of being locked in prison and the same impact on your physical body, whether you're innocent or not. And in the case of Daryl, <clears throat> because he had been convicted of the rape and murder of a white woman, he experienced significant racism by the guards, by the COs who would leave notes on his on his bunk, you know, um, they, they had him harassed by, by, you know, skinheads and members of the clan who were incarcerated. And, you know, it's just, how do you, and you lock someone away for 20 years. And unlike, you know, I, I, I like to think of it this way. When we send students abroad, we have a reentry program for them coming back to campus. We don't necessarily have a reentry program for people who are exonerated. It's like, they're supposed to walk out and go, wow, now I get to have a cheeseburger and life is great, but we don't, we don't offer services to heal the pain and trauma that they've experienced serving decades in prison, right? Decades. Um, it's a really great documentary, highly recommended. At, at this point, I think you just got to get it on YouTube, but it's, it's worth the two hours and 15 minutes. You can get um, it on Amazon too. On Amazon. Yeah, that's right. You can get it on Amazon. Not that we're pitching Bezos, but just um, so one last story to close out, and that'll leave us some time for conversation. Um, this is a, a woman that we interviewed as part of our recent project. We spent um, across three different suburbs, we interviewed uh, people living and in, incarcerated in and working in solitary confinement units in a state prison system. Um, and one of the people that we, we, one of the prisons that we, where we did the work um, was a women's prison. And one of the things that we already knew about um, the sort of school to prison pipeline is the, the, the sort of feminine corollary to that is the sexual abuse to prison pipeline. About 85 or 90% of girls and women who are incarcerated have a history of sexual or intimate partner violence prior to their incarceration. Um, so we were doing research <clears throat> interviewing women who were incarcerated in a special kind of unit for people who have behave, behavioral management problems. Um, they self-harm, um, they do things like that, that the COs determine they can't be controlled well in general population. So they like the shoe, it's not called solitary confinement. It's called something like that, but it, you know, technically they don't call it that, but that's exactly what it is. And one of the people that we met in there um, is a woman we call Marina and Marina um, is also one of those tragic cases. She was um, sexually abused as a kid in and out of foster care. Um, one of those sort of experiences of just kind of being thrown away and, and, and disregarded by the system that should have been caring for her, a system that should have been taking care of her. And when she was 11, um, probably, you know, a volatile 11 year old with a lot of anger and rage because of everything that was happening to her and going on in her life. She grabbed a knife out of the kitchen counter, off the kitchen, out of the drawer, and she ran out the door and she stabbed a woman on the street corner and she killed her. And Marina's black, the woman who she killed was white. Um, and it was a tragedy, right? A woman lost her life and that was a tragedy. Um, but not anyone that Marina knew. So it seems as if, you know, she was just a, a rageful, angry, very forgotten young girl who had experienced enormous trauma by the age of 11. So at 11, she was charged with first degree or second degree murder. Um, and she was taken to the women's prison because that's where you send people who are convicted of that kind of a crime. And because she was 11, they put her in solitary confinement um, to keep her safe. Um, as she aged in solitary confinement, she got out for small bits of time and acted out. She has behavioral problems, um, which is not a surprise because you locked an 11 year old in solitary confinement. You didn't give her the heat, you know, you didn't address the issues that that led to her being there to begin with. Um, and so the sad story about Marina is that she's she's now in her mid 30s and she's been in solitary confinement more or less since she was 11 years old. Um, as the slide says, you know, she goes from menarche to menopause in it locked in a, in a solitary confinement cage um, without any of the resources that she needs um, to be able to recover. So she was having therapy time um, when we were one day that we were there and she was coloring 
And I leaned over and said, wow, that's, you know, I really like your picture that you're coloring and purple's my favorite color. And we started talking about it. And she said, you know, that she wanted to give us the picture. And so we were like, yeah, of course that would be great. And so this is the picture. And we include it in the slide because this is a woman in her thirties um, who after decades in solitary confinement is coloring in a children's coloring book. Um, she's never really been allowed to go to school. She hasn't had any of the resources. I um, mean, she will die. She asked Dr. Smith, what, what was her first question when you interviewed her? Am I going to die here? What are we doing, right? I mean, that we, we're, we end here to say, what are we doing? Um, would this have happened if she was white? Um, probably not. Never would have even ended up in this circumstance. Um, but the tragedy of throwing away Black lives um, just is no more profound than I think the, the story of, of Marina, who my question always when we talk about her is, you know, this isn't a question of Marina making a mistake. This is a question of society failing. Unless the purpose is to control black kids. And if the purpose is to control black kids, then maybe we've done a really good job. But if the purpose isn't that, then, then what have we done wrong? How have we failed children like Control Jackson and Daryl Hunt and Marina? Um, whose responsibility really is that? And I'm gonna stop the share because that's the end of the slides. Um, yeah, we, um, we have a, a chapter in the book early on where we go through the history of policing and policing of black people. Uh, we, we share some information there about riots that take place in Michigan because young people are swimming in the lake and supposedly they've crossed over onto the white side of the lake. Uh, we have another chapter, which we think is really unique, uh, where we do uh, the work on the policing of Black athletes, the policing of Black athletes' bodies, uh, Black athletes like Serena Williams, uh, Brittany Griner. Um, you can imagine during the heyday of Tiger Woods' career in a country club sport like golf, uh, the kinds of things that don't make the headlines or the uh, front pages of what he had to endure as the only African-American on the major golf scene. Um, and so we look at what happens to the people who we would say have made it. Mm -hmm. They're rich, they're famous, they live in gated communities, they have yachts. Um, but boy, uh, the policing and, and, and it leads up to the unfortunate piece that anybody who's paying attention to sports this summer of what these athletes were telling us about their mental health, mm -hmm. the gymnasts, the swimmers, the tennis players, uh, having the, I don't know what to call it, the guts to finally tell us after having to put up with all this mess, this is harming me mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, because we assume that athletes are strong people. You have to be strong to be an athlete regardless of your sport. You can imagine why Jackie Robinson died when he was 53 years old. Uh, all the nonsense he had to put up with uh, having people treat him and his family like dirt. But yelling when he hit a home run, yelling when he stole third base, uh, but couldn't even buy a house in Brooklyn. So uh, we think the book is timely, unfortunately. Uh, but we wanted to tell a story that weave together literal, literal and symbolic policing. And that's, that's what we did. Thank you so much, both of you, Dr. Smith, Dr. Hattery, uh, so much information. And, um, you know, we look at the topic you picked was, was young people, but even if you took the whole big picture and all people, the numbers would just go up so immensely. Uh, Mary, you had a question? Uh, that's an understatement, Stan. I have several <laughs> questions, but I will... I will uh, not not take up all the time. Um, 
I I'm I was intrigued by in in your book and it's I, and I'm I'm speaking of the one not your latest one but the one before that on uh, policing it's called uh, policing black bodies that one um, I'm, and and there's one section where you talk about you 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 uh, quote extensively someone else and you and then you say uh, police what police are doing is not a crime. They are doing what they are trained to do. And as someone who went through a police academy, I don't remember that direct message, but I certainly remember the indirect message. So would you would you speak about that a little bit? The sure moniker, that. the moniker that you would know better than us is to serve and protect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, in so many of the communities where we, we looked at, uh, that's what police do. They come in to serve and protect. But when it comes to the interaction between the officer, the person uh, coming to either tell you that your kid got sick at school and you know they're helping to bring the kids home or they're pulling your cat out of the tree. Uh, police do that. Mm -hmm. But they're also taught to unleash havoc on you if you don't obey what they're saying. And I don't think there's any better example of that than the tragedy that occurred with Sandra Bland on that long, on that highway headed to Prairie View University, when that officer said, if you don't get out of this car, I'm gonna light you up. That's what we mean when we say police are, what do you say in the academy, that this is the message that they get. It doesn't even have to be verbal. It's we're strong people, we have the, uh, uniform, the badge, the gun, the nightstick, and probable cause. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Probable cause covers everything from here to there. And so if I can come in, I'm, I'm the law. If I can come into your community, if I can come into your house, then you have no recourse vis-a-vis -vis my word against yours. And so you're right, uh, Mary, it may not be in the police manual. It may not be in the seminars in the academy, but it's understood that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. push comes to shove. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna take care of you, and we know that it's disproportionate taking care of you when the community is not white. We no, know and, that. And, we have and, the data to show that. Right. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that. I, and I'm, I would also, and this is something that we have not discussed in the last almost two years now that we've been doing this, um, is by extension, you know, when you, when you and, and Professor Hattery, you use the term white supremacy, by extension, you also have social workers, you have teachers, you have uh, mail letter carriers. I mean, you've got all of these people who are representing white supremacy. And so I'm just wondering what your prediction, you know, you, you have been steeped in this stuff for I'm, I'm sure most of your careers. What do you think about the future? Are we still, you know, five years from now, are we still going to see these young white men from the suburbs roll into our communities every day and and be gods, like I, I have said before, and that's exactly what they feel like. They feel like they're gods. And how do we stop that? Here's what's scary, Mary. Uh, take January 6th, so-called insurrection. We, you know, we watched it and you say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But now that we're in the weeds of trying to understand it and what happened, I am afraid that my fellow soldiers, when I was in the military, could have been those people. I'm afraid that all the people they're arresting, but the, no, they're, 
whatever they're doing, they're not arresting them. They're, they're, they're putting their names they're on charging them. them. They're charging they're some of them. Charging them, uh, but they're not arresting them. All those people are affiliated with sheriff's offices, police departments, uh, government officials, even hints that some of them are in Congress. This makes me afraid that this thing out here that we, we call symbolic policing, you mentioned the letter carriers. How many of these letter carriers are documenting uh, where we live? I mean, they can walk right up to our door. Uh, how many are taking pictures? I mean, it's, it's like we thought George Orwell was telling us something with 1984. This is well beyond 1984. Uh, it's scary, scary, scary. Um, and what's going to happen? You're supposed to be making us feel better. Wait well, till you read the I'm next. I'm just like I want to just go to bed and put the covers over my head. <laughs> I, I was. I know you have to go to a faculty senate meeting, but um, but I think you know that. We have been talking and writing about this for quite a while, and I think what's really discouraging is the real story of way down in the hole is the, you know, part of what we learned watching January 6th is who's also in that crowd are a lot of prison guards, a lot of uh -huh. CEOs. Uh -huh. And what we learned is that when you build a prison in a rural white community and you fill it full of black people and you lock them in solitary confinement, it produces and reproduces white racial resentment. Sure. And so you stoke up everything that Trump was able to tap into, right? And so where do we go from here? I mean, there's so many, there's so many answers to that or so many things to think about. But one is let's have some honest conversation that this is white supremacy, that this is not a criminal justice system. It might be a criminal legal system, but let's talk about it. Let's not be afraid to have those conversations and use that language. Um, and let's stop, you know, let's figure out, I mean, this is such a like pie in the sky answer, right? But, but I think we have to start being honest and we have to start acknowledging that the system benefits white people and it oppresses black people and it removes them from the social political economy so that white people and I'm white, we don't have to compete, right? And until we can wrap our arms around that, it is very depressing. I put my head under my covers every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm... I'm I'm so sorry. I, I do have you to have go. To I'm go. sorry, Stan. I do have to go. But I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You all have, have just been so gracious to give your time and your expertise. And uh, when that next book comes out, expect a call, another call from us. We appreciate you so much. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. You're thank welcome. You. Good day. Good day. And it goes beyond that because I, I, my dad passed away. And so we oh, got in touch oh, with his family in uh, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina. And so we all got on an airplane and we went out there to visit. And we were sitting in a living room with six black men, five black women, now our, our new relatives and good friends and we're enjoying our weekend with them. And we got to talking about the political system out down there. Well, every man in the room had criminal history. Every man in the room was unable to vote. Every woman in the room to not make her man feel like he's less a man didn't vote. And I look at the system and, and like you were saying, the political uh, uh, ramifications are huge because I sat there and I looked at the, this room and there's 10 votes, 11 votes and nobody was voting because of the prison system. And because most of them got their criminal records at a young age. And, and they were living productive lives that after that one incident, they were living normal lives and doing good things in the community. But that early uh, 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 interaction with uh, law enforcement changed their whole lives. So I appreciate you sharing that. And one of the things we talk about in the book there's a really great piece of research that was that looked at the the felony disenfranchisement in the Bush Gore election and they reran the analysis and had people who should have been allowed to vote be able to vote the election would have turned out differently right so it has huge enormous national 
consequences. But we also talk in the book about the local consequences. So in so among black men who've not graduated from high school, 70% will go to prison. And if we can't, if if black men's not graduating from high school is concentrated in certain communities, you can literally have a community where nobody in that community can vote. And forget about the national election. They can't vote for the sheriff. They can't vote for the prosecutor. They can't vote for the school board. They can't vote for the people who then will make the laws that make more of them more likely to go to prison. Right? And, and add to this today, many of those school boards, and a lot of people don't pay attention to local school boards and this and that, many of those school boards are starting to uh, continue the practice of removing books from the library, uh, telling people they can't talk about slavery uh, because it never existed, uh, forcing teachers to teach a curriculum that they may not believe in or teach it or uh, remove yourself from employment. I mean, this thing is huge. And, and if you go back to the, to, to the uh, Johnson years in the 60s and all the social programming that was just cleaning up the, the Jim Crow mess, all of it is now being reversed. You know, part of, part of this business in the Biden administration, they can't pass the legislation to, to dole out the necessary money for childcare and dental assistance, et cetera. Part of that is many of those people in Congress don't want black folks to have access to schooling, to daycare, to family leave, to health, et cetera. And, and, and it just makes you wonder, do we live in a society where this whole thing is silico? That it, you, know, you get X number of good years, good legislation, social progress, and then you get another 10 or 20 years of not so good legislation. I mean, it's, you know, Mary left, she says she want to cover her head, just go to bed. Uh, it's daunting to, to, to deal, deal with this stuff day in and day out. And so I hope that the, 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 the folks in the audience, the young people in the audience who are studying, uh, who will become the next generation of the intelligentsia, uh, I hope they're looking at these things because we need folks who can enact good, positive social change, Great including thing. changing how the police uh, act. If if we get it, if we get rid of something like uh, what is that thing um, that police hide behind? Oh, uh, qualified immunity. Qualified immunity. Yeah. Get rid of that. You've taken care of half the problem. And, and it also goes to what I was going to bring up, and that was a great segue, is um, the most unlooked at person on the ballots are judges. People don't even know who that guy is, where he came from, what he believes in, but that man will change your life. If you ever get in trouble, if, say DUI, theft, uh, family practice, and you could go on and on and on, you're going to be in front of this individual that you voted in because you don't even know nothing about him, but you just checked the box, and this guy could change your life, and most would, of the time, not for the better. I, and I would add to that process. So one of the things that got us really interested in unpacking the wrongful conviction and exoneration data was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where Daryl was wrongfully convicted and later exonerated. It's a community of maybe less than a million people. There are three people who've been exonerated. So the question, it, that, that would never happen by chance, right? It's because the prosecutor was running a dirty shop um, and the prosecutor, you know, allowed people to lie, cops to lie, plant evidence, not reveal exculpatory evidence. So you're exactly right, right? You vote one of those guys in and you might be the next victim. You may be the next victim. And, and one of the things that you, you talked about on also is, um, and I know this happened in North Carolina, <clears throat> is uh, there was a, there's a sheriff in Arizona that, I mean, a sheriff, a warden in Arizona that had that tent farm and he was literally recruiting people for the uh, for the workforce, he made it clear yes. that's what he was doing. He made it clear when you go to jail, you're gonna go to work, 
and he and, and and everybody looks at it and thought, well, good job, good job. And he even got pardoned from by a president uh, for, for doing this heinous act. And so uh, we don't realize we got to be more aware. And I'm glad you you have so many books. So each book covers different areas and, and aspects of uh, illegal processes uh, in the minority community and, and just period. And so um, uh, just amazing how we go year after year watching on TV what is wrong and never seeing it changed. And I wow. think part of it, we never change wow. because we don't have these honest conversations, right? Because most people living in the comfort, well, if you're white in particular, if you're white, this is something you don't have to think about, right? And so you don't, and you don't get educated about it. Um, we don't talk about it. Um, and, and one of the things you had said, you said, let's, uh, what we could do is we could talk about it. And one of the interesting things is, is if you are a judge, a, 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 a police officer, a, uh, a prosecutor, why? It's working pretty good. Exactly. You're benefiting from it. You're benefiting and, from it. And that's what's so great about the program you guys have here is that you've dedicated every week to have these conversations, right? I applaud you. I think it's amazing. So impressed. Thank, thank you. Uh, Jody, Connie, you have any questions? Well, we have, a, we do have one from one of the students says, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, very eye opening. How in the world do we make a difference? Angela? I mean, I think part of what we've talked about is how to make a difference in the big sense, dismantling white supremacy, dismantling heteropatriarchy, dismantling systems of oppression. Um, and that's which of us can get out of bed and think about even how to start doing that. Um, but there are things that you literally can do today or tomorrow. And one of the things we do at the end of the book is a whole list of them. Um, something like this, have these kinds of conversations. Um, but, but to pull a little bit more sociology back into the conversation too, we employ Eduardo Bonilla Silva's concept of colorblind racism. And most people misunderstand that to mean I don't see color. But what Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silva means is policies and practices that appear to be race neutral, but are not. Policies and the practices that appear to be race neutral, but are not. So one thing everybody can do is interrogate policies to determine if in fact they're race neutral or are they not race neutral. And you know that can be everything from the sentencing disparities in crack and cocaine, it can be stop and frisk, it can be the way that we poll 50% of black kids get one touch at least by the foster care system, by, the, uh, by CPS. Th that's not race neutral, right? That's, that's a, a policy and practice that's specifically targeting a certain community. So like you said, Stan, don't just vote for things, like read, think through, ask questions. Is a policy a referendum that's on your local ballot something that will be administered in a race neutral way or isn't it? And if it isn't, let other people know and don't vote for it. Like that's one simple thing that you can do, especially during this season. And Jeremy's putting some stuff in the chat. Thank you about Eduardo's books. Yeah. Dr. Smith or Stan, well, whoever. The other thing is, um, since we're in a college setting, um, for those of us who are parents, we, we have children, uh, let's be honest with our children because they're gonna grow up to be adults and they're gonna go out into the world. And we need to explain things to them, even if some of those explanations are painful. Um, you know, you hear about the talk. Uh, I, you know, I have to give my boys, but not girls, but I have to give my boys the talk. Well, what about the young ladies? Uh, they need to know as well. Uh, parents need to be able to say to, to their children, I think I would say to mine, uh, we have to be respectful. We have to um, be honest with other people. But at the same time, we need to be learning about who we are, where we come from, what type of society we live in, what type of neighborhood we live in, uh, and not be 
walking around with blinders on uh, in the everyday context. We have to be knowledgeable. We have to be proactive. Uh, and I think parents can do that instead of what we're seeing today, where parents are telling the school board, don't, don't allow the students to read Maya Angelou's books. Toni Morrison's books are, are on the chopping block. What is that? I mean, I, I, I have a that's, hard time That's understand. white supremacy. That's white it's supremacy. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Don't read certain books. The young lady from the New York Times that uh, was supposed to get the job at Chapel Hill in North Carolina and now is going to Howard. Look at what happened to her. All she did was put in an application that she was asked to put in for a particular position and white supremacy took it away from her legally with no consequences. I mean, on, in plain sight, we saw what happens to black people. No, white no guy, doubt. one white guy says, you know what? I'm not gonna give you that other hundred dollars that I uh, promised to give to the uh, endowment unless you get her out of here. And what did they do? They got her out of here. They got her out. Uh, one, one of the students says, uh, what are we doing in terms of making a change uh, the protests only led to increased increase in police budget and hardly a policy change in Minneapolis that was particularly overturned. He also goes on to say making incremental incremental changes in small and local uh, governments seems redundant when the local com communities tend to be even more polarized. And, and I, I agree totally. I mean, I think one thing that we haven't talked a lot about, and I know there's just a couple minutes left, so we're gonna <laughs> drop it in right at the end, but one of the things we haven't really talked about is the connection between the system, the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration and capitalism. Um, people are benefiting from the system financially and other people are not, you know, as you mentioned, Stan, like this is a workforce that, that can be harnessed. Um, this is, people are making, police departments are making money off stop and frisk and writing tickets. If you want to learn about that, read the Ferguson report. It's unbelievable. Um, but we've got to, we've got to be honest about the role that capitalism is playing. And if this, you know, if, if follow the dollar, you know, one way to, to, unseat some of this is make it costly to, to maintain it um, and make it less costly to get rid of some of it. But, you know, it's a, it's a hard nut to crack in the sense that it's been here for 400 years. It's deeply embedded in, you know, the constitution and the history of the United States and white supremacy, and it's linked absolutely to capitalism. It's a lot and of we have to, According to the student's question, uh, I would agree but we also have to start somewhere. And in places like Minneapolis, New York, those police unions run the show. Uh, the mayors bow down to them, the governors bow down to them. Uh, some of those uh, local police departments did enact changes, but were rebuffed later on down the road. And, the, and, and in New York, for example, the changes were turned back. But that doesn't mean we stop fighting. You have to continue to fight. And as Dr. Hattery said, uh, if you're making money through the system of capitalism, you're not going to give it up. Uh, and if you can make money by locking up Black people, taking them out of the competitive realm of uh, seeking employment, going to college, uh, think about, to put it this way, here's a way to end it. Uh, take something as simple as baseball. So you have baseball and everybody says, well, you know, you, you either like it or you don't. It's slow. It's, you know, you're watching paint dry. Um, but there was, there were young men and, and women because women played baseball uh, that were relegated to the Negro leagues. And they were told that they can't play in mainstream baseball. And they didn't for decades and decades and decades. Well, only recently, maybe last year, uh, Major League Baseball said, you know, uh, we can make a little money if we uh, highlight the big shots that came to white Major League Baseball like 
Satchel Paige, Jackie Robinson, et cetera. And then they went one step further and said, you know, some of those players had records that far surpassed white major leaguers. You know, Babe Ruth hit 70 or so home runs. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of those Negro League players were hitting 80 and 90 home runs because they were playing two and three and four games in one setting. My point is Major League Baseball figured out that they continue to make money in a sport that's declining by including the, the, the big stories, the, the robust stories of the Negro League players. I mean, it's fascinating what people will do to make money. Yeah. Yeah, Josh Absolutely Gibson. Yeah, Josh oh. Gibson, his, his record is huge. And, and oh. you're right. Uh, all of a sudden, things are getting kind of soft. But I'd like to go back because one of the things you're doing a book on is the athletes. And I just want to touch on, you know, we get our great athletes doing great things. And I, I'll never forget the time when they went after um, uh, Michael Jordan and his gambling. It's like, are you kidding me? This man lost $50,000 on a golf course against Charles Barkley. And his $50,000 on that golf course is worth $5 to me. So he said, and he even said that, he said, you know, you're looking at this money like it's something big and it's like five bucks to you. It's, you know, I have, I have a lot of money. I can do that. But the problem was, is, oh, what about all the poor black kids that you could have helped with that money? And they twisted it. And, and so I, I'm really interested in, in your, your upcoming, your book on the athletes. I am so excited about that one. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those men and women who are superior athletes, who make it to the big time, who make lots of money, uh, it's, a, it's a, what do you call it? It's a double-edged sword. sword. Uh, the mainstream likes them when they can score a touchdown, et cetera. But they're the only athletes, the only athletes on the planet who the question comes when they're being interviewed, uh, what are you doing about giving back to your community? Now, they don't ask white athletes that question. You know, even if they have foundations, et cetera, they never ask them, uh, Tom Brady, what are you doing to give back to your community? Yeah. yeah. I mean, how many turkeys are you passing out on Thanksgiving? Yeah. They don't ask those questions, but a black athlete, First of all, if they're making money, it's their money. They can do with it whatever they want. If they put some of it into the communities, well and good. That's up to them. But it's condescending to ask them, what are you doing for your community? Exactly. When nobody else is asked that. Think about the NASCAR races. NASCAR is one of the most profitable sports out there. And all you do is drive around the track. Just drive, drive, drive. They never ask those drivers what are you doing for your community yes it's 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 terrible yeah. well i'd like to thank both of you for being here we need to close up but i'd like to thank both of you for being here and uh, uh like mary said maybe in the future we'll have you back um so. so much information uh given uh, i'm sure the students enjoyed it and i uh, uh thank you so much for being here and uh look forward to seeing you again in the, in the near future and on that, we'd like to say thank you everyone for joining us today and being a part of our event. And um, good luck. Uh, let's see. Let me see. Next week, uh, Tuesday, I'm sorry, moving too fast. Uh, Dr. Joseph Darden, Texas Christian, uh, the witness, Witnesses of Blue Lives. And I thank you everyone for being here. Thank you Thanks, for having Dan. us. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.